Um, so thank you very much um, for being here, for, for inviting me, and thank you to Raj for inviting me to, to come to this event. It is great, actually, to see it happening, and it's great that we've got something that is dedicated um, to clinical informatics, clinical data, and clinicians that are so keen to, um, to really use that um, information, that data, and to lead the way. Um, before I start, can I, I'm just going to come out here so I can see better. How many of you in the room are doctors? Cool. How many are AHPs of some description? And how many nurses have we got? Okay, cool. That's about, the, that's about the average, I thought. So for those of you that aren't nurses, as the Chief Nursing Officer for England, you will know, I will actually talk a bit about nursing, so um, apologies for that. But I'm hoping that what I talk about will also be interesting to clinicians of whatever type and whatever your, um, your background. Um, the other thing is I'm not an IT or a technical expert by any shape or form. So those of you that know me will know that that is true. Um, but that doesn't matter, because the important thing is about how we promote and use data, technology, information. And I think that's what's so vital, and that's why I was so pleased um, to be invited. So some of you will know this, but I'm guessing that quite a lot in the audience won't, that in May last year, I launched uh, Leading Change, Adding Value. So that is the framework for nursing, midwifery and care staff uh, that we've, that we've uh, developed with thousands, thousands of people. We've asked nurses, midwives, care staff and patients what was important to them. We looked at the five-year forward view. We looked at what, was, um, what the, the world was, was doing. We actually decided um, that we really wanted to put a framework around the over 550,000 nurses and midwives that actually are in England. It's a huge number. And if you think about the impact that all of those individual people can have, both as individuals, but also together, so we talk about the power of one, the power of many, um, there's a real opportunity for nurses, midwives, care staff, and all clinicians to really drive the change we want to see. And sometimes I think it's quite frustrating. I spent a lot of time talking to people. I go out and about, I visit hospitals, I visit communities, I visit practices. And what I often hear is people that get quite frustrated with um, and hugely challenged, and it's massive pressure out in the system. I completely understand and accept that. But people actually don't always feel that they've got the ability to make those changes. And one of the things that I think is so powerful about clinical roles is we can. You can, we can. And as Martin said, there is something about us really driving that change and actually delivering what we think is important for the people that we care for and the, and the, and the public that we care for. So leading change, adding value is directly linked to the five-year forward view. And it's specifically looking at how we can reduce the gaps that were identified in that five-year forward view around health and wellbeing, care and quality, and also funding and efficiency. And it's central to that is reducing unwarranted variation. And as a result of that, we've got technology running throughout the document. And when I go to the next slide, a specific commitment around it. And when we launched this in May last year, um, there was a big difference from the previous uh, strategy that I'd launched, which was done in 2012, when I stood on a platform like this with about 400 senior nurses and I launched Compassion in Practice. This time, I was in a small room in London. There were quite, the room was packed. We ha it was filmed, and it was live web streamed out to over 2,000 sites, um, both across England, but also internationally. We had, que we had um, live questioning coming in from around, around the country, including questions from Australia on what we were doing. And so we actually were able to access a lot more people and people and pe in hospitals and communities they brought people together in rooms it was a bit daunting talking to a camera and knowing that i was being you know displayed on screens all over all over the country but it actually had an impact and we got to more people so that to me was um, a, a big change for me in terms of how how i worked you won't be able to read these um, but there are 10 commitments um, that underpin the framework and the idea about those commitments is we wanted to really identify the things that were important to nurses, midwives, and our, and our patients. 
and they are grouped in a sense. So there's about three that look at population health and prevention, really picking up the importance of that specific area of need. There's uh, one that talks about how we, how we work with people, how we engage with patients, carers, families in a very different way, not the paternalistic, you know, maternal type approach that we have in the past used, but much more in collaboration with people that we work with and we care for. There are key, pro uh, key commitments there around staffing, making sure we've got the right number of staff or trying very hard. I, all of you will be aware of some of the difficulties that we have at the moment with that, but also listening to what staff say. So doing, using your um, data, your information to understand what staff say is important to them is one of the best opportunities to make improvements in patient care. If you've got staff that feel um, listened to, empowered, content, even though they may be under significant pressure, we know that there is a very clear impact on patient outcomes and patient experience, very, very clear correlation between, between the two. And specifically in there is a commitment on the use of technology. And it says, it's commitment 10, and it says, we will champion the use of technology and informatics to improve practice, address unwarranted variation, and enhance outcomes. Really, really important. And Anne Cooper, who's speaking later, has been um, engaged and involved in us in both in developing this and helping us to implement that commitment. So at the moment, we've got an increasing number of um, clinical information officers across England. When I, when I did this, uh, I did a talk similar to this a, a while ago, we had about 50. We've now got a lot more than that, multi-professional. And actually having people with that level of expertise, that knowledge and the ability to drive and explain and to talk to people in their organisations about the importance of clinical, clinical informatics is really, really key. And I'm going to talk a bit later about um, a presentation that was, um, we had at my summit when people talked about what was important to them. I've also got a short video or short film later which just talks about how some midwives in West Sussex have actually used social media and technology differently to engage with their, with their pregnant, um, pregnant women. So that was my leading change. That was my addressing unwarranted variation one. So where are we in terms of um, the leadership challenges that we've got? Quite often when you talk to people that maybe haven't been as used to um, using digital or technology, they, it is actually quite daunting. And I remember talking to a, a chief nurse who was part of the panel and presentation we had at my summit. And she said, I just don't think, I didn't think I knew anything about this. I didn't think I was able or capable of being able to lead this in my organisation. And I think you, for those of us that are in the sort of, I'm a baby boomer generation. Um, when you look at some of the people that are now coming through medical school, um, universities, it's a very different world. If I need my iPad sorted, I, I stand more chance of asking Raj's five-year-old to do it than I do actually trying to sort it myself. So there are things that we are in a very different world than we used to. So the pace of change will continue to increase. Um, directors of nursing, lead nurses really do need to have you know, digital transformation wherewithal. If they don't know, not be, not be afraid to ask. We know that we need to have really good nursing and other clinical experts um, in technology, in science, trying to really drive and, and increase that, that amount. And we also need to be very aware that our patients will be much more empowered, that they will come to your surgery, they will come to your consulting room, they will go into your, into your organisations and they will ask questions and they will look and they will search and they will have information and they will feel they want to be involved. And for some people, that's quite daunting. For others, it's a real opportunity. So last year, um, we held uh, a jointly facilitated workshop. So it was led by NHS England and Health Education England. And we also had NHS Digital um, as a key partner in that. And we asked a variety of different questions about how can we make Commitment 10 real? What can we do to really make it real? And we had some organisations in the room. We had Imperial Healthcare. We had Frimley Healthcare. Interestingly, both acute trusts and I know later Joe Rafferty is talking about the importance of data and information in mental health services and we do still I think too often relate more quickly to an acute environment than we do necessarily to primary care or to mental health or to learning disability and to other areas or community so I think there's something that as clinicians we need to really drive that that change in those areas 
So attendees considered all of the areas that we've identified um, on this slide. And actually, as a result of that, we've got some really great work now with NHS Digital about how we produce it. And Anne is leading the Building a Digital Ready Workforce program um, together with um, colleagues in H and HEE. So I think that will, really, that will really help us. So how do we build a digital ready workforce? For nursing and midwifery, or nursing, we have just published, or the NMC have just published new standards for undergraduate education for nurses, and they're about to do the same, they're in the process of looking at midwives as well. How can we build into undergraduate education the need to become, a, or the, the ability to become a really good digital ready workforce? What do we need to do to engage in that? How can we ensure that clinical experts in this field are actually out there through talking to students, talking to undergraduate students across their, across their clinical placements about the importance of, of digital technology and data? Really, really key to do. So let's have a think about some of the some of our roles so the data the importance of data is really is really is really key and although i have i don't do it all the time um i think using data to improve service provision and service delivery is absolutely critical it really does help us challenge so if you're looking at unwarranted variation you need to ask the questions so you know what what needs to change how do we know how can we look at variation so what needs to change and then how do we change it? So if we've got data and we've got information and we can show that variation, it will really give us a pointer of how we can improve care. And the result of that will be improved outcomes, improved experiences, both for our staff and our patients, but also much better use of the resources that we've got available. So the right care work, you're probably all aware of, I would, I would imagine. And the, the importance of that is really looking at how variation is, what variation there is across the country and how we can look at best practice. It's a bit like the GERFT programme, getting it right first time. Really, really reducing some of that difference that you can't justify by geography or demographics or the type of um, severity of illness that a particular person's got. And, and the very, um, on one level, would look like quite a simple example. But Betty's story um, is about leg ulcers. So um, just to, uh, to get a bit of interaction here, do you, anybody in the room know how much we spend on managing wounds and the associated comorbidities? Any idea? Give me a figure. God, you're half. You can't, you, did you all go to the NH patient safety conference, uh, dinner last night? 5.6 billion. Well done. How do you? So it's funny now that you know that you've, you've seen my slides. Yes, it's actually 5.3 billion, so pretty close. So 5.3 billion pounds a year. Um, so we reckon we've got about 2.2 million people across the UK that've got a wound. About 30% of, of, of these have no diagnosis on their GP uh, record around what's, around what's wrong. And we know that leg ulcers is the biggest one. So if we concentrate on the best way of treating those wounds, and, we, and there is clear evidence that using that can improve outcomes, can increase healing, can reduce cost, and actually will improve the experience for people, all of us, particularly those of us that have worked in places like um, A&E or um, in clinical care or in GP surgeries or community care, will know how, how distressing leg ulcers, for example, can be. So one example that we ought to do more work on. I think digital leaders need to be all over the SDPs. SCPs are, as you will know, um, being set up, 44 around the country. It's bringing people together to look at how services can be provided for the population that they serve. They're in different stages of development, but I think we've got a really great opportunity to shape them and influence them. And actually having digital leaders, people that really talk about how you can join up uh, data, you can join up information, you can share, you can work together, actually will have a big impact. So I continually say to nurses and midwives, get out there, knock the doors down, say you want to be involved. Um, there, to be honest, there are more GPs, there are more doctors involved in STPs, and that's fine because there's clinicians involved. But for those of you that are nurses, I would say get out there and get stuck in and, be, and, do, and do the same. And the five-year forward view has clear um, expectations about what we should do. So it talks about helping people manage their own health, using data and information to do that. It talks about digitising hospitals, really key again. It talks about making sure we've got better use of technology across elective care, urgent and emergency care. 
and about the digital contribution to research. So some really key areas that we as clinicians can drive and lead the way. So I think um, lever uh, leveraging that um, technology and innovation, supporting individuals to take an active role in their own health, while at the same time enabling NHS staff and colleagues to do their jobs um, in the best possible way, reducing wasted time is a really key, uh, um, a key way of working. So I'm just going to go on and talk a little bit about uh, leadership and technology. So I mentioned earlier that I have a, um, an, I have a, well, I didn't mention this. I mentioned I had my annual summit. And so last March, just gone, we had a conference that we held in Birmingham. Two days, about 500 nurse leaders, academics all over the, all over the country were there. And we, this year, we, we, we centred our summit on four themes of innovation and improvement, leadership excellence, culture, personalisation, and it was all done within the Leading Change Adding Value framework. Um, it, it's a really good opportunity for senior leaders to come together, and they we were, had a really a very good, almost strategic approach to some of the key challenges that people were facing, and how we as leaders could come together to really try and push some of those things that we wanted to see. One of the things we did was a session on digital transformation and information, and the particular role, uh, leadership role of nurses and midwives. And we had a panel of um, strategic and frontline leaders. And this was, the, this was where um, Janice, um, my colleague, who's the executive director of nursing at Imperial, was there. So she, she presented and said, I took on this role in my trust, big trust in London. I really didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I'd have the knowledge or the skill. And she was able to articulate so brilliantly the impact of doing that work and what a difference it had made. And she's got one of the, one of the guys that works for her, Jerry Bolger, many of you will know, is a real driving force in, in, in clinical informatics. So we also had Deborah L. Said, who's the Director of Digital and Multi-Channel Development in NHS England. And we also had James Freed, who's the Chief Information Officer for HEE, on the panel. And it was chaired, as, um, um, as, as you can see there. So there, it was a really great discussion, actually, a really, really important discussion. And it, and it talked about the challenges and benefits of delivering the national efforts to uptake the use of digital technology. There was a long debate about how can, how can we really champion uh, nursing and midwifery leadership to, um, to take that forward. And it actually talked about um, digital, um, the digital agenda from a clinical point of view, from a nursing and clinical point of view. So to those in the audience that maybe haven't thought about it or hadn't used it or hadn't really thought about what their role could be, it really opened people's eyes and the feedback we had from that session was absolutely brilliant, really, really important. So I would say do more and something like today is a really good opportunity to do that. Really, really good opportunity to do that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, general practice nursing leadership. Um, and the reason for that is I, I think sometimes we talk about nursing and midwifery and we don't always talk about general practice. They, sometimes G, GP nurse or general practice nurses will say to me that they feel sort of a bit lost and abandoned. They don't have the same access. They work in, often work in small teams. Um, some have obviously work in bigger ones, but most people, most of them work in small teams. They don't have the same access to wider um, information. They don't often get as much access to conferences like this, but actually they are critical in driving change and they're critical in helping patients manage their own health. And they are critical in actually using and sharing data across the system. And we've got some great examples on our website of general practice nurses that have looked at reducing unwarranted variation through some of the data that they've got across their practices so really really important i'm about to um so somebody's phone's going off here oh well it might be yours raj okay um somebody um i'm about to launch um a 10-point action plan for general practice nursing and looking at how we can really enhance that as a career framework a really important place for people to want to work and how we can support and develop general practice nurses going forward so that that's coming soon and when we were at the and both Anne and i were at the rcn congress um earlier this year, and they launched a programme about every nurse being an e-nurse. Really, really important, recognising the importance that nursing plays in that field. So again, something that we are, used, we are continuing to drive. Um, I want to talk just briefly about enablement and self-management. So we talk often about support now about supported self-care. 
Many people, many people in this room, including me, including Anne and others, have got a long-term condition that we actually spend quite a lot of our day-to-day -day life managing. Many years ago, I would have been, I would have gone to somebody, I'd have gone, trolled along to the hospital, somebody would have taken my blood, they'd have told me that my diabetes was okay or not okay, they might, the nurse might have told, or the doctor would have told me to change my insulin dose. Now, that's something that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And for people like, you know, for others that have got pumps, it's an hour-by-hour -hour basis or even more frequently than that. The ability to self-manage and to look at and to take control of your own long-term condition in your own life is something that we are doing more and more and more. It puts the relationship with clinicians in a very different place. But using data, using technology, it does make a huge difference. So me being able to put my blood sugar testing machine, link it into my laptop, send the results to the, the, nurse, um, the nurse practitioner in the hospital who looks at it and then, when I go, and then we have a discussion about what I might need to change um, something or other. And most of the time now, I, well, I have done for many years, change myself. It's a phenomenal difference, and that's just one long-term condition. And when you think about all the others that people have got, and many, I'm guessing, many people in the audience will have something that they need to self-manage, it's a very, very different approach. So making sure that we really enable patients to use that data, use that technology. Looking at telemedicine, I was in Cornwall not long ago. I was also in Bradford uh, last week, where I was talking to... Um, and I was talking to a GP from Bristol on last week as well, where they are using technology to monitor patients and to have automatic links into clinicians that are able to respond if they see things going, changing or going off. Some patients self-managing and reporting data through, some others actually relying on something that is maybe you know, attached to the patient's arm that actually is able to, to monitor their uh, vital signs they can i know people with copd that do all you know, that manage their own temperatures their own peak flows etc etc so there is something about really changing that relationship between patients carers and clinicians to really support people to be, to look after themselves in the best way and the vast majority of patients actually want to do that the Child Protection Information Sharing System, CPIS, for what it, is another completely different example of us using technology in a different way. So this is um, an ongoing um, NHS-sponsored, working closely with NHS Digital. Between the two of us, we are very, very working very closely on this. And this is an initiative that helps clinicians in unscheduled care to identify vulnerable children. It's really innovative, it's the only one of its kind in the world, and it means that data relating to children who are, including those that are unborn, with a child protection plan, looked after status, um, are securely transmitted and stored in CPIS on the spine. And it means that it can be flagged when, people, when, when children attend. So whether, it's a, whether you've got an emergency department, you're a, some sort of urgent or unscheduled care, it brings together that data, that information and enables people to check and to understand whether they, they, that particular child is vulnerable or more vulnerable, whether they've got a child protection, uh, they're on the child protection plan, or whether they've got looked, up, they're looked after status children. Really, really important. So we've now got thousands of children with those protection plans that have been uploaded onto CPIS. And it's something that is shared with local authorities. So this is not just the NHS, it's local authorities and the NHS working together to support vulnerable children. It's another, life, another safety layer in safeguarding. Absolutely critical. And so we are, very, we are rolling it out. Um, we want to get it out as quickly as we possibly can. And NHS Digital have, uh, have been brilliant in helping us um, to do that and to, and, to, and to make that work. So if that just saves one child from an, from an injury or an, un, an unfortunate incident, it will be worth it. Absolutely critical. So I've given you, I've did a quick canter through. I was d making sure that I, A, I stayed of time and B, that people, because it's probably quite a long way to get to coffee, actually, on the basis of how long it took us to get into this room. So what I wanted to do was just finish um, with, a, with a short short film clip. And this is from West Sussex. And it shows how midwives identified an issue they had at their trust with um, people not wanting to talk very much about, about their weight. 
and they used social media and different and technology to really increase their engagement with women. Um, it had a significant impact on women. It increased the engagement, it increased, um, improved patient experience or women's experience. Um, just a simple example, but just one of many that we could have shown today about how things can improve. I think it will play. We found that we had a really good group to support women during their pregnancy with weight management issues. But unfortunately, many of the women didn't attend that group. Women felt very judged when we were talking about weight in pregnancy. Certainly if they traditionally they went to see one of the consultants or one of the doctors talking about the weight and they used to find that that was a very negative appointment um, and they used to feel very, very judged when they came out of that appointment. So we wanted to turn everything around. One of the things that we did was actually ask ladies that did come to the group what would engage them a little bit more within the group. And one of the things that always came up, you know, everybody always on their phones all the time, was actually Facebook. As midwives, we realised there were these problems and we couldn't get women to attend. Our Facebook group was the first Facebook group that was set up within the unit. And um, it, the, there was a, a, quite a lot of negotiations that went on. Since the group's been set up, we've noticed there's been much better attendance. Women are aware of what the groups are about. They interact more, they talk to each other, they've got more confidence, they feel more positive about their pregnancy and the service they're getting and the extra pathway they have for their pregnancy care. The project's very important in adding value to patient experience. The benefit of the peer support that people get from the Weight Management Facebook page means that they're able to build up relationships and share experiences which they've reported back to us they found extremely helpful. Using social media within this setting has become very positive towards us. It's given us lots of confidence as midwives. We've been able to get the information out to women um, and overall the communication between the whole team has improved. I would say to other midwives and other trusts that actually, you know, this is something that is worth trying within the service, the maternity service. Our engagement with our local population has significantly increased. So... I just thought that was just an idea and it, yeah, it's social media so it's not um, using some of the data and some of the opportunities that I talked about earlier but I just wanted to end there to say thank you very much um, for listening I hope it was uh, reasonably interesting um, and there are some real experts in this room um, that would be at, that are able to talk about how they've used data to improve services so Anne's here Seamus is in the room who I used to work with when I when I was in the northwest and it was he's been somebody that was continually giving us data about emergency care performance enabling us to change what we were doing so there's lots of examples lots of people in this room that are real clinical leaders so thank you for what you do and um, go out and continue to spread the word and let's this time next year let's see this room absolutely full thank you very much um, Jane thank you uh, for uh, keeping us to time um, but um, um, Jane's going to be staying back for the question time session um, but I'm happy to take about two or three questions um, if there are any from the audience so if not you can catch me over coffee Absolutely. So, right. Um, do, do, do you want to speak? There's some mics in the audience? Yeah. Okay. I don't see any mics. Okay. Do you want to just speak up loudly and I'll repeat the question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Vince Smith. Just a question about variation. And um, we're already seeing pockets of variation across the NHS. For example, my field is chemotherapy heat. Okay. Just, just hold it for a second. There's a mic there. Yeah, good. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Vincent, I'm a clinical research fellow at Oxford. Um, we're already seeing pockets of variation um, with digital, um, for example, e e chemotherapy e-prescribing and also GP e-health records. Um, but we're probably still at a point where there's the opportunity to ensure a much more un um, universal dissemination. And whilst these don't necessarily cause any patient patient kind of inequality issues, um, it may interfere with the communication across trusts or across systems. Um, and variation in itself, it, 
may cause inequality, but also it allows the opportunity for innovation as well. So do you think the priority is to necessarily stamp out variation um, or, and therefore allow kind of more standardized dissemination? Or do you think it is the current system where individual trusts will kind of adopt a system and then gradually kind of iron out across across different areas? Do you th what, what do you think is more important? So that's, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think it's a bit, I would say, in the words of Helen Bevan, a bit both and. So I think, I think variation is often fine and it will drive, it will drive innovation, and it will drive change. But you have to be able to, I think, you have to be able to explain the variation, you have to understand it. And if variation is there because um, people aren't following evidence-based practice, they're not doing what people know is the best or the right thing to do, um, it doesn't mean that you can't develop and innovate, but I do think that it's very hard to justify why some people may get a much poorer um, care or the much poorer outcomes because people don't deliver what they know, what we all know is the, is the right thing to do. But having said that, I do, I do agree that actually looking at variation and then looking at what you can do to change does actually drive innovation. So you need to do a bit of both, I think. Would be, it's probably not the, it's not an and or, I think, I think it's both. Good, thank you, Jane. Um, just, yes, David. Hi, Jane. Hello. I've enjoyed the talk. David Rowlands. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, as clinical lead for maternity for the Northwest Coast Tree Clinical Network. So I was really interested in your uh, Facebook and weight loss. <laughs> Did they actually achieve that in terms of the ladies who engaged with that Facebook program? Did they actually achieve the end point, which to me, uh, as an obstetrician and, uh, and a clinician, would be weight loss? I can appreciate it reduced the social isolation, the, it's less, less judgmental, but was there actually a demonstrable improvement in weight loss? Yeah, I haven't got the figures with me, but yes, the, and I, I actually checked that before I put it on, <laughs> because I would show up for that very reason. So yes, it did, because the women engaged more, and because they were able to, they, were able, they worked together to understand that it did have an impact, um, and it did actually enable people to lose weight over and above what they would otherwise would have done. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I know she sort of introduced herself as not being a clinical informatician, but uh, having worked with Jane for many, many years, um, um, she's been an ardent support of, uh, of having a connected uh, clinician frontline and is a massive supporter on NHS England's board as one of its directors for clinical informatics. So, so Jane, thank you very much indeed for coming in today.